Welcome to the Giving USA 2021 Dunham & Company webinar. Today I'm your host, Rick Dunham, founder and CEO of Dunham & Company. And by way of introduction, just so you know, our firm is a member of the Giving Institute, where I have the privilege of serving as a member of the board. And also, uh, I am the immediate past chair of the Giving USA Foundation, which publishes Giving USA annually. Today I'm honored to introduce our special guest, Una Ossoli. Uh, she's become a dear friend and colleague as we've worked over the years together. Uh, she is the Associate Dean for Research and International Programs, Professor of Economics and Philanthropic Studies, and Dean Scholar at the Mays Family Institute on Diverse Philanthropy at the Indi Indiana University Lilly Family School of Ph Philanthropy. The school is the world's first dedicated to increasing the understanding of philanthropy and improving its practice worldwide. Una serves as a lead researcher on Giving USA, which is one of the reasons why I'm just so uh, grateful for her participation today. And it's really an honor to have her join us. During the, uh, the webinar, Una will guide us through the Giving USA uh, data for this year and help you understand the implications for your organization. Uh, and during the Q&A at the end of uh, our webinar, she and I will help you understand how you can create actionable strategies to adapt to the changing philanthropy uh, landscape to maximize your impact. So without any further delay, let me introduce Una. Good afternoon and welcome to all of you who've joined. It is such a pleasure uh, to have this opportunity. And I want to thank Rick and his colleagues at Dun Dun Dunham Company for giving us this wonderful opportunity. And you are among the first around the world, around the country to preview the Giving USA 2020 results. The report was just launched yesterday, and today we have the opportunity to do a deeper dive. So I think uh, without uh, further ado, let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with the big picture. 2020 was an exceptional year. It was also an unprecedented year, full of challenge and uncertainty. At the same time, there was a higher demand on many nonprofit organizations. And here we can start with the good news. Americans of all different backgrounds, corporations, foundations, and um, the bequest sector stepped up in their generosity. We know that all of the actions of individuals, foundations, uh, charitable bequest holders, and corporations led to a new record for charitable giving at $471.44 billion. What made these results possible? Well, first of all, we did have um, a strong end of the year uh, growth for the stock market. And we also had a rebound uh, towards the end of the year uh, in many parts of the economic landscape. Now, I want to start by just noting that um, overall in 2020, total charitable giving grew by 5.1% measured in current dollars and adjusted for inflation, that was an increase of 3.8%. With this new record in mind, you may all be wondering, where did all the giving go? And so on the next slide, we're going to walk you through uh, the contributions and the destination for those contributions. The great news is that the record increase achieved by many charitable organizations was felt in many parts of the nonprofit landscape. There are over 1.3 million nonprofits in the United States. And a big part of the success story that we saw in 2020, despite the challenges and the uncertainties of that time period, we also had tremendous innovation in the nonprofit sector. Nonprofits of all different kinds had to adapt to a fast changing landscape, working remotely, conducting donor visits via Zoom, switching events to virtual galas and many other sources of innovation. But importantly, nonprofits had to pivot in order to meet the demands and the demands were multi multiple and, and complex. So let's start with the largest recipient of charitable dollars. That is still the religious congregation um, landscape receiving 28 percent of the charitable contributions. Educational institutions received uh, 15 percent. And we also saw strong growth in human services and public society benefit, which refers to umbrella organizations or organizations that serve a multitude of uh, purposes. 
during the webinar today, we'll have a chance to do a deeper dive into the parts of the giving landscape that performed quite well in 2020, but we'll also point out parts of the sector that experienced more challenges and constraints as they sought to meet needs and also uh, engage donors and uh, fund rates. Now let's go to the top 10 findings. Every year, our team spends quite a bit of time sifting through the data, uh, trying to determine what were the most important findings. And today I'd like to walk you through those top 10 findings. It's always uh, exciting to emerge with this top 10 list, but there's so many findings yet to unpack. And I encourage you when you do have the time to download the full report and engage with all of the information that's available through the report. So first, and the most important takeaway of today, giving reached a new record. This record was made possible by all the actions of the nonprofit sector and the fundraisers in the audience. So if there is one piece of good news and a takeaway from this year's report, all of us need to, in the nonprofit sector, need to continue and build on this new record and also understand that even as uh, the economy starts to recover and many return to in-person engagements, there are a lot of lessons to learn from 2020. Well, let's look at the numbers and what has changed and also what has stayed relatively the same. First, the largest contributor or the largest segment of American philanthropy is still individuals. This is an important takeaway. In 1980, individuals made up 84% of all charitable giving. Today, individuals are still the lion's share of American philanthropy, but you'll note that this slice has gone down to 69%. What has changed? Foundations have expanded their footprint. In the 1980s, foundations occupied about 6%, so less than 10% of charitable giving. Today, that slice has increased. And what we also know is that in 2020 foundations stepped up in their generosity. It was this 19% took place because foundations of all different kinds, small family foundations, as well as larger family, larger foundations, took the extraordinary step of responding to needs in their communities. Not only did they increase their out, um, outlays in, in several areas in responding to COVID, but also in response to the racial and social justice movement. We also saw foundations become more flexible in their grant making, um, increasing uh, flexibility to their recipients, and also tailoring uh, more unrestricted giving, tailoring requests to meet the needs of nonprofits. All of these changes, I think, um, point to an opportunity for nonprofits to develop new types of partnerships with funders. In addition, we saw in 2020 an expansion in charitable bequests as the U.S. population continues to age. This is an excellent time for nonprofits of all different kinds to build a charitable bequest component into their work. And finally, corporate giving, although it has stayed uh, relatively the same in terms of its share of overall giving, we've seen tremendous innovation from the corporate sector. In particular, over the last decade, corporations have become more strategic in their philanthropy. They've invested in workplace giving and matching dollars, but they've also broadened their emphasis um, with cause marketing, sponsorship dollars, and marketing dollars. So, for all of you who do work with companies, I think it's important to recognize that there are many different ways for nonprofit organizations to build relationships with corporations. And not, not all of those relationships are direct through the foundation or the grant making um, allocation. So number one finding, giving reached a new record. Let's switch gears now and think about what made these extraordinary results possible. We say this often, but it's worth repeating. The environment in giving, uh, for giving in 2020 was unprecedented. In particular, there were three areas that um, 
need to be lifted up. The first one was the COVID pandemic, which is still unfolding, not just in the United States, but around the world. We see this often, but the COVID pandemic was unlike any other crisis that any of us have experienced. We would have to go back 100 years, and this was before giving USA was in existence, to really see events of this magnitude. Every community was affected, not just in the United States, but globally. And the COVID pandemic is far from over. Um, although vaccines are becoming more available, we still have uh, restrictions still in place as a result. In addition to COVID, mid-year in 2020, we also had the rise of the racial justice and, and social justice movement. And with the pandemic, uh, pockets of the country that are still uh, recovering, we had record unemployment at the beginning of the year and a decline in GDP, as well as uh, corporate pre-tax profits. By the end of 2020, though, things had begun to improve. Uh, in particular, there was a lot of optimism about vaccine rollouts. There was also increasingly the actions of the federal government, specifically the PPP program and the stimulus dollars allowed American households and uh, firms to start to recover. And then uh, importantly, for those of us who have been uh, watching uh, the financial markets, we did have a very strong performance of the uh, stock market, especially at the year, year end with the S&P growing at 16.3%. Uh, tw 2020 ended up being one of the best years on record in terms of year over year, I think comparable even to uh, 2013. So we take all the events of 2020 together combined all of the uh, economic factors as well as the social and political factors had an important impact on giving. As we look ahead, you may be wondering, that was 2020, that's in the rear view mirror, what can we expect to, going forward? Well, as we look at the economic factors that influence giving, there are some very positive signs ahead in 2020. One, so the stock market has continued to grow in 2021. We're seeing GDP rebound in this uh, first half of the year and personal disposable income has also grown. It's also important to note that many households uh, have accumulated savings. The personal savings rate uh, grew in 2020. And for many Americans, they are in a position to give. And so for all of you in the audience who are wondering what should we expect for 2021, I think it's important to understand that households give when they have the economic and financial resources to give. And certainly how households feel about their economic situation will continue to affect giving. Uh, as we have mentioned, as the economy has started to recover, that does provide a more encouraging environment. And certainly for all of you who are fundraisers and nonprofit leaders, we should all be uh, optimistic uh, while recognizing that there are still challenges ahead with uncertainty about uh, the pandemic and the new strains that are emerging, but also that there's still uh, pockets of need and many households are still facing very challenging economic circumstances. So that leads us to the third finding. This is another piece of good news for all of you working in philanthropy and the nonprofit sector. When we look at the successes of 2020, the results were broad-based. Individuals experienced growth. We did see specifically some very large gifts made in 2020. Mackenzie Scott with her record, uh, more than $6 billion paid out. The founder of Twitter, Jack Dorsey, another a large commitment, $1 billion made in Twitter stock and foundations of all different kinds, individual um, family foundations, community foundations stepping up. In fact, one uh, resource here at the Lilly Family School shows that over $1 billion was committed to COVID relief by community foundations and United Ways uh, in 20, the first half of 2020. Uh, the only source of giving that experienced a decline in 2020 was the corporate segment. And we will do more to unpack those results. A simple answer for the results with corporate giving is that corporations were more impacted by the economic downturn with corporate pre-tax profits declining. So let's take the next finding 
as we try to unpack the results of 2020 and also look ahead to 2021, I want to point out one variable that uh, we have highlighted already. Giving is very closely linked with the stock market. We saw that in 2020, but we've also seen that in other periods. It's worth emphasizing that giving tends to be a lagging variable. The stock market often has to improve before giving improves. And that reinforces the point we made earlier that individuals give when they feel financially and economically secure. And increasingly, when we look at very large gifts, many of them are made out of appreciated securities. So for those of you who have been paying attention, this is a great time to engage individuals, especially those who are who have financial assets because of the performance of the stock market. Saying, uh, staying on that message about uh, stock market performance, this matters not just for individual giving, but also for foundations. Foundations in particular had a very strong year. It's actually um, one of the best years that we've seen in recent times. Giving by foundations increased 17% in current dollars to an estimated $88.55 billion, reaching its highest ever dollar amount. And adjusted for inflation, foundation giving rose by 15.6%. We've seen in the past few years, really remarkable growth by uh, foundations in terms of their giving. And uh, 2020 was a, a very important year for many foundations, not just in the dollars they gave, but in the innovation that the foundation sector showed. I mentioned the uh, introduction of more unrestricted forms of giving, flexible funding, but also new instruments. For example, um, the Ford Foundation issuing one of the first ever bonds linked to its foundation assets. I think going forward, we do see that uh, many foundations are looking to continue to use uh, some of these more flexible instruments. Now for another piece of good news, but uh, one that also is a challenge for all of us going forward. Giving as a share of GDP has stayed at about 2% over the last two decades. And in fact, one of the questions we're often asked is what would it take for giving to go beyond 2%? Well, in 2020, we did reach a, a new uh, high water mark at 2.3% of GDP um, with the charitable sector accounting for one of the largest shares on record. However, this was achieved in a very difficult financial and economic environment, and GDP actually declined in 2020. So what I would say going forward is that for all of us in the nonprofit sector, we need to build on this uh, expansion in generosity, but we want to also make sure that uh, we are doing it in a way that increases the uh, percentage of Americans who are participating, but also that uh, it is not uh, born out of more difficult uh, economic environments. So there was one aspect of charitable giving that did not see such a favorable outcome in 2020, and that was corporate giving. Many have been surprised by this result. And in fact, we've received a lot of questions from media and others um, with questions about why did corporate giving decline in 2020? Now, this decline is in fact attributed to the decline in GDP uh, in 2020, but also the decline in pre-tax profits. It's also worth noting that economic um, uh, activity across the um, aggregate corporate giving landscape was quite uneven and mixed. While the tech sector performed quite well in 2020, many aspects of the corporate landscape faltered. So the service sector, travel, and many other large swaths of uh, corporate uh, performance were challenging in 2020. We're starting to see things um, pick up in 2021. More recent data show that firms are um, recovering. Even segments of the economy that really struggled in 2020 are starting to show rebound. So we do expect that as GDP starts to improve and uh, corporate pre-tax profits rebound, corporate giving will follow uh, some of those uh, positive trends. 
And with that, we're now going to turn our attention to the last rest of our top 10 findings focused more on where charitable giving goes. And here I'd like to start by just saying that the results in 2020, the positive results were felt broadly across most of the charitable subsectors that giving USA tracks. In particular, some of the high um, areas of performance, seven of the nine subsectors grew and giving grew by more than 8% for five subsectors. So as you think about which subsector you reside in, we should note that giving to education increased by 9%, driven by a strong end of the year stock market and supported by contributions to research on COVID and other um, related health issues and donations to historically black colleges and universities. We also saw a strong growth in many other areas uh, of the charitable sector, human service organizations experienced increases in giving, growing by an estimated 9.7% or 8.4% adjusted for inflation. And international affairs also grew by 9.1% in 2020 or 7.8% adjusted for inflation. So across the board, we did see growth. There were some parts of the charitable landscape that experienced more, um, could say adverse conditions. The arts and culture segment was one as well as healthcare. Uh, both of those results will have a chance to uh, do a deeper dive, but I do want to mention that particular challenges for arts and culture had to do with uh, in-person performances, fundraising events, and engagement opportunities, which were more constrained during the pandemic. Now let's look at the bright spots of 2020. Human service organizations experienced rapid growth in 2020. Um, as many of you know, the combined effects of COVID and the um, economic fallout associated with the pandemic meant that Americans of all different backgrounds faced tremendous economic hardship. Human service organizations grew at nine, over 9% 9 in 2020. And this growth does fit a pattern that we've seen during other downturns where many Americans have shifted their giving to support basic needs. Um, we do expect that as the economy recovers, um, some of the organizations who've been on the front lines of, of COVID will see some reduction in the demand for their services. Human service organizations not only performed quite well in fundraising, but also in their ability to deliver on their mission. Um, and across the country, we saw human service organizations not just dealing with the pandemic, but but also addressing issues like wildfires, flooding, hurricanes, many other uh, crises in local communities. And that takes us to number eight. Number eight is uh, a finding, the, the next slide will cover uh, part of the charitable sector that experienced more uh, constraints in 2020, and that was giving to the arts and culture segment. We saw a decline of 7.5% in giving to the arts. The shutdowns affected arts organizations, not just in their ability to fundraise, but even in their earned income and revenue streams. Many arts and culture organizations had to cancel uh, their uh, annual fundraising events and move their performances online. Uh, the word that we heard throughout the year was pivot and not all organizations had the capacity to quickly move uh, uh, performances, uh, orchestras, all of those online. Um, going forward, we do know that uh, arts organizations are starting to um, develop hybrid options uh, to combine forces to have in-person events, but that there are still challenges as they seek to fine tune those models and continue to engage their supporters. In many communities around the US, arts and culture uh, organizations are vital to the quality of life. And so there is um, a need to continue to engage arts and culture donors as well as others. On the bright side of arts and culture, we did hear from organizations that were able to pivot, that they reached more people through these virtual events. And they were also able to build new communities and engage new types of donors. So I do think a 
call to action for all of us on the call today is how do we take some of the lessons of 2020 and build, uh, rebuild in a way that does promote uh, more equity and more access, especially in parts of the giving landscape that have had challenges connecting with new donors. On the next slide, there is a lot more to say about the events of 2020, but underlying all of the results we have uh, discussed today is the importance of innovation, collaboration, and experimentation. Many nonprofits found that they could not just go back to business as usual with uh, new forms of giving emerging and new ways of connecting with donors. One that really stood out to all all of us here on the uh, Lilly Family School uh, side of this project is the role of crowdfunding. Crowdfunding allows organizations to connect with all types of donors and typically younger donors and more diverse donors. We also saw the rise of mutual aid and other non-traditional forms of philanthropy. As organizations start to rebuild, return to in-person, there is a sense here that uh, there has been an influx of new donors and nonprofits will have to communicate their impact and build trust and also engage those donors going forward. Two examples really stand out as we think about the unprecedented nature of 2020 and the opportunities that it provides for nonprofits. The CDC Foundation dates back to 1991. They were able to raise over $50 million through a platform, a new platform called charity.com. We also know that Facebook fundraisers crossed the $5 billion mark. And finally, uh, even organizations like the World Health Organization stood up a new crowdfunding and individual donor platform. So lots of new opportunities ahead. And that leads us to the very last finding of our top 10 list. And that is the new record set in terms of online giving. In 2020, online giving achieved a new record at 13% of overall giving. This is based on Giving USA data as well as Blackboard uh, Institute data. And we have been following the trends in online giving, certainly over the last decade, online giving has been growing rapidly. However, it was still on the under 10%. And this was a surprise to a lot of uh, observers who expected online giving to really take off. It took the events of 2020 to move not just more donors to online giving, but many organizations of all different types, religious congregations, uh, small local organizations, as well as large organizations to start to invest in their online giving programs, even hire individuals who have that specialty. And if you look at the trends over time, you'll see that we are at an inflection point in online giving. On the next slide, you'll see uh, the trends in online giving have um, hovered around seven or 8% of overall giving. Well, in 2020, online giving grew at over 20%. And so we're now at a new record. And the question and challenge for all of us is first of all to acknowledge the, the challenges and the opportunities that lie ahead, but also know that today we have many new vehicles, many new platforms, and 2020 has given us uh, perhaps a, a newfound landscape to reimagine what's possible in all of our organizations and to reinvest in engaging our donors, building community, and ultimately delivering on our mission. So I'm going to stop here and open it up for our questions and very pleased to have my uh, colleague, um, Rick Dunham, join us for the question and answer period. We'd love to hear from you. What are the surprises from this report? What trends did you see that perhaps we did not mention? And what ideas do you think we should build back on as we start to think about the year ahead? Uda, there's one question that came in from an attendee. Uh, why did you choose to link COVID-19 research to education versus to health? That's an excellent question. So we have not just uh, been studying um, charitable giving, but we've also been looking at some of the large gifts that have taken place. And most people assume that a lot of the COVID gifts went directly to health organizations. But what we saw with the very large commitments that came in 
many of them went to university uh, hospital systems and universities who were conducting research around the vaccine, but also on delivering services at the beginning and, and developing testing programs. So although um, you might think those went to health organizations, they were a mix of education and health. And because of the focus on COVID and, and vaccines and research in particular, groups such as the American Cancer Society, Health, American Health Association, um, also face some challenges, not just in fundraising, but also in engaging donors, conducting events, and so forth. So a lot of this is just more how gifts are classified and the fact that research and a lot of the work around COVID tended to be conducted more through a university and research institute. Una, there's another question that came in um, over the chat as to innovation going forward. What do you all think of F2F marketing coming out of COVID, whereby nonprofits or other fundraisers set up outside retail outlets, et cetera, to inform, uh, inform people of cause and to harvest the donors? And I think Rick will take this one. Yeah, uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, very good question. Face-to-face -face fundraising and marketing has been around for quite some time. Uh, it actually was quite... Um, significant in uh, Europe, especially the UK. And of course, we've worked globally with many organizations, some of which have used face-to-face -face, uh, fundraising. And what we've found over time is that the retention rate of those donors who were, requ who were acquired through face-to-face -face fundraising was very low, uh, very difficult to convert them into ongoing support. So, um, there are times when it might be appropriate, but as a core strategy, I would focus more on more, on more traditional ways to acquire donors, especially today uh, with our ability to effectively target a demographic that we know is uh, more likely to support our cause through digital advertising in particular. Uh, I find that much more effective than something like face-to-face. -face. Thanks, Rick. And another uh, question, uh, why didn't the recession why didn't the recession have an impact on giving in 2020 the way that uh, the Great Recession did? That's a great question and one that uh, we have also been able to unpack. Now, 2020 was a recessionary year. There's no doubt about it. GDP declined, and not only did GDP decline, but also we had record unemployment, the highest unemployment since the Bureau of Labor Statistics started tracking unemployment. So many industries uh, were hard hit, many businesses shut down. So a very, um, you could say, unfavorable economic environment. However, However, there was a bright spot in the economy, and that was the financial market sector. The stock market not only rebounded after March, but then hit new records. And when you look specifically by industry, you saw uh, groups like uh, the tech sector in particular uh, having some of their best years on record uh, with companies, uh, their stock appreciating in at levels that we hadn't seen before. So we had two distinct trends, the real sector where GDP, unemployment, all of those having a, a more unfavorable year, but a very distinct positive trend in financial markets. So what we know is that individuals give not just out of their incomes, but out of their assets. And because the stock market performed so well, and overall, towards the end of the year, as vaccines became um, more available and there began to be more optimism about the future, we started to see individuals becoming more confident uh, about their spending. It's uh, one last point to mention, although uh, we, the economy was in a recession, we had uh, essentially a very uneven economic picture for 2020. Half of American households were working remotely. Many of them were actually in a position where their incomes uh, were increasing. They had uh, savings. They were able to accumulate uh, lower spending because uh, they didn't have to commute to work. They didn't have uh, a lot of their discretionary expenses and they had more disposable income available for charitable giving. On the other hand, you had a, a swath, a, a very sizable segment of the American population that was faced with health challenges, unemployment, job shutdowns, business losses. And so uh, this uneven picture 
is worth uh, unpacking because uh, even though we had a recession, it was a, a recession that was not broad based compared to the Great Recession and financial markets in particular performed uh, quite favorably, which led to, as we've seen, a very strong year for charitable giving. Rick, I believe you have a follow up to this. I do. Uh, on, in addition to what Una just shared, um, our research throughout the pandemic, we conducted three different uh, pieces of research monitoring donor confidence through the pandemic. And what we found is that, especially the core donors, the people who are most likely to support charitable organizations, stayed fairly strong in terms of their commitment to give and their belief in the future. And I think that really, again, drove um, giving. And then as Una mentioned early in today's webinar, one of the things that was a phenomena of the um, pandemic was the jump in the savings rate. Uh, I've seen studies where as much as $2.1 trillion was put into savings between February and December of 2020, meaning people had more discretionary income to give. So to, to Una's point, it was very uneven. And for those who were committed to supporting organizations, they actually were uh, in a pretty good financial position as their expenses went down to put more money into charitable organizations. Great. And um, here's a question about a, a topic that's on everyone's mind these days, donor advised funds. What happened with donor advised funds in 2020 and how did this contribute to overall giving? Also a great question. I would say that is probably one of the most frequently asked questions uh, around uh, giving USA every year is donor advice funds. Last year, 2020, we saw quite a few trends with donor advice funds. One very prominent trend was the granting out of donor advice funds. In other words, people who had already committed their uh, dollars, their assets to donor advice funds, those charitable assets were used in uh, significantly to contribute. And that's also similar to what we saw in the Great Recession, where donors were granting at higher rates out of their DAF uh, holdings. In addition to that, we also saw movements like Half My DAF, where a social media hashtag where donors were being encouraged to really step up their granting out. In addition to the grants out of the donor advice funds, we know that some households were also increasing or setting up those accounts in 2020. So increased use of those charitable vehicles. And uh, in terms of the giving USC data, it's worth noting that um, DAFs are counted in the public society benefit uh, subsector, the national donor advice funds, but that donor advice funds also reside in other charitable subsectors. Some educational institutions now host DAFs Indiana University Foundation, for example, a donor can establish a DAF within the IU, so an education organization. And then finally, community foundations have always, at least uh, since um, the 1920s or so, hosted donor advice funds. And during the pandemic, we saw that many donors um, who had established those accounts at community foundations were uh, really motivated to give out of those assets. So for those of you who are thinking, is this a good time to engage with DAF holders? Absolutely. Many of those donors um, are very committed already to charity and have already made a commitment by setting up their DAFs. And uh, with the pandemic, but also the racial equity and social justice uh, protests and, and movements we've seen over the past year, uh, a tremendous opportunity to engage those donors. And another question that's central to the findings of this year's report, why is individual giving shrinking as a share of the pie? Good question, and one that we've been tracking. So a big reason for that is that uh, this didn't start with the pandemic, but actually dates back to the 1990s when uh, with accumulation of wealth, uh, greater wealth and income inequality in the US, we're seeing many wealthy households set up foundations, private foundations that started in the 1990s. And as those individuals and those foundation assets have grown, um, that has increased the uh, foundation slice of American philanthropy. Now, having said that, I do want to emphasize that half of the foundations are actually small family foundations. 
in terms of uh, one or two uh, individuals, maybe one staff member, and those operate more like individual uh, donors uh, in terms of engagement and building relationships. They may not have an RFP process. They may not have, have um, a, a whole staff um, that uh, are involved in the foundation. So as nonprofits are thinking about the implications for them, it's still the case that American philanthropy is still uh, the lion's share attributed to individuals, whether those are individuals that are giving out of their pocketbook and checking accounts or savings accounts or individuals who have small private foundations. Great. And um, Rick, here's a question about taxonomy. Uh, where do nonprofits like the Salvation Army, Compassion International, World Vision, and other large faith-based organizations fall by category? Religion, social, public benefit, or other? Sure. That's a, that's a really good question. Uh, so Giving USA has uh, adopted the national taxonomy of exempt entities as a way to categorize uh, charitable organizations. And when you look at religion, that is made up of uh, houses of worship, denominational groups, um, and missions, and Christian media or religious media. And uh, so uh, religious organizations that don't fit that category fit in the category of their cause. So World Vision or Compassion would show up in international. Uh, a university that's a uh, religious university like a, a Biola or a Wheaton uh, would show up under education. So it actually doesn't capture all the religious, re religiously motivated giving in America. And Una, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but there was a study uh, a few years ago that I think was sponsored by the Jewish Feder Federation that looked at re religiously motivated giving and if I recall, something like 75% of all giving in America was religiously motivated. That is correct. And so um, in some ways, uh, lots of charitable organizations have a religious uh, component to them, or even if you look back into their history, they started as a faith-based institution. I, I always give the example of Harvard University uh, was actually uh, had a religious component when it was first started to train ministers. And similarly, groups like the YMCA, YWCA, uh, and many, many others have uh, strong roots in, in religious communities. Here's a question about strategy. Are you seeing any trends over the last year in greater use of wealth overlays to efficiently allocate scarce donor engagement resources? Yeah. Uh... Wealth overlays have obviously been around for quite some time, and uh, the number of companies that are providing that kind of a service have, has increased. And yes, uh, it's learning how to understand what those overlays are actually telling you in terms of the donor's capacity to actually give. So there's a, a bit of a nuancing on that, but yes, definitely. Um, we are seeing that. In fact, it's a methodology that we certainly use with our clients to help them um, better understand the donor makeup and potential for engagement and support. Here's a question about bequest giving. Why did giving by bequests increase last year? Yes, that's a great question. There are lots of, of reasons for that. Um, I'll start by saying overall, uh, bequests are the most volatile components of giving. They tend to uh, fluctuate, especially because of the closing of very large estates in a particular year. So we see fluctuations from time to time in charitable bequests. In 2020, however, we are seeing an aging demographic in the U.S. As, uh, as that happens, bequests are likely to go up. So more households um, that um, are in a position to make charitable bequests. We also had a higher, um, and this is a very unfortunate uh, consequence of the COVID pandemic, but more individuals that um, uh, experienced uh, mortality or someone in their family. And so that led to a charitable bequest. 
In addition to the trends in 2020, we're also seeing that uh, the pandemic and some of the related events have opened up um, these conversations about legacy giving and bequests more broadly. And many organizations are finding increased interest uh, by donors in setting up those charitable bequests. So the pandemic has made it perhaps more straightforward to have those conversations with donors. And many donors are looking at their uh, legacy commitments uh, in light of the events of 2020, where um, over 600,000 Americans being affected by uh, COVID and, and related illnesses. Great. And um, here's a question on giving to religion. Why did giving to religion only grow at 1% in current dollars, really staying flat at minus 0.2% uh, in inflation-adjusted dollars? Rick? Yeah. Uh, so, and I know that Una can uh, definitely add to this from their research, but from what we saw, as people know, when the pandemic hit and lockdowns were ordered and in-person gatherings were prohibited, uh, many churches really struggled to pivot quickly to the online space. Now, certainly, there is a significant proportion of churches that already had an online presence and had uh, giving facilities that were not localized but rather uh, digital. And they even they had some initial uh, negative impact of the pandemic but recovered well. And so I think overall, giving to religion, my sense is that... Um, because of the, the inability for many to meet throughout the year together uh, and a certain sector of, the, of churches uh, struggling to keep people engaged and to uh, motivate ongoing support, that I, I think that definitely was a factor in seeing a, a weakening of, of giving to religion. Una? Yes, I w could concur with all of those points that you mentioned, but also a bigger issue, I think, for American congregations um, going forward is that there are some trends that we've seen over time with declining attendance, fewer Americans attending services frequently, fewer Americans affiliating with religious uh, uh, denominations, the rise of the nuns. Some of you have heard about the growing number of American nuns, and it's not N-U-N-S, but it's N-O-N-E-S. And in the 1960s, we had less than 5% of Americans who declared that they didn't have a religious identification. And today that number is over 20%. Um, so if you take those trends, combine them with, with what we saw during COVID, where congregations moved to uh, virtual um, services and uh, many congregations did not have online giving opportunities, um, did not have them prior to the pandemic, and the idea that many had to pivot, which is quickly develop the capacity, implement the infrastructure, and also um, engage their supporters and their, their congregants in a way that uh, made sense. Uh, that was uh, quite a bit for many organizations and religious congregations, especially uh, given the, the fact that um, all those types of innovations are costly and take time. So the congregations that seem to have weathered the storm were the ones that actually had made these investments prior to the pandemic. So they had virtual links so you could attend online. They had the ability to engage um, their congregants online. And then they also had online giving vehicles, mobile giving uh, vehicles. And I think going forward from uh, our work with our religious congregations, we've seen a number of them who are reluctant to make these investments have um, have made that pivot, have uh, in that made those investments. And surprisingly, um, they are starting to see the results uh, that it, it's not just the younger people that uh, can can give online or attend services online, but it's really all of their congregations because of the health crisis we're in. Great. That wraps up our que questions and answers for today. Thank you, Rick and Una, for these helpful insights into Giving USA 2021, the annual report on philanthropy for the year 2020. And if you have not yet purchased Giving USA 2021, you can do that now at givingusa.org. When you order Giving USA 2021, you'll receive an annual subscription to all of Giving USA's digital content, including previous year's annual reports, free digital copies of upcoming special reports and access to special webinars around relevant, relevant nonprofit topics.
As a reminder, an email containing a link to the recording of this webinar and a link to purchase the annual report will come your way within 48 hours. Feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. And thank you again for joining us. Have a great afternoon.